I want to ask you if you got a copy of the Word this morning to take it out and turn to the book of Psalm. Psalm 111. Psalm 111 is where we're going to be at this morning. And uh, while you're finding that, when you find it, I'm going to ask you to stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. And uh, I want to say a special, special, special thank you to every single Sunday school class that showed up yesterday to serve the community. Man, it was awesome to see so many people out and about. And I realize some of you could not make it, and that's all right. We're not begrudging to you for not being able to come, but you should be very proud of your class and your church for being present and visible in the community, demonstrating the love of Jesus. And so I want to say a big thank you to everybody that showed up yesterday to participate in that. All of you who cooked for us, praise the Lamb of God for that as well. And so uh, just give Jesus just a shout of amen or something for doing such a wonderful thing yesterday in the life of our church. I heard so many people say how much of a blessing that it was just to be able to serve like that. And so uh, I hope and pray that becomes something that is uh, something we do regularly, not necessarily because we plan it as a church-wide function, but as each Sunday school class feels the need to do it, that you would do it. Amen? You don't have to have our permission to go serve somebody. Just get after it. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, hurry up, get to the text. All right. I can't help it. You shouldn't be so good. I wouldn't make you stand so long. Psalm 111. Now, I want you to listen to this with your heart. I want to read verses 1 through 10, and I want you to follow me there. The Bible says, praise the Lord. Now, I could stop right there, but I'm just going to keep going. But it says, praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart. In the assembly of the upright and in the congregation, like like now. The works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have pleasure in them. His work is honorable and glorious, and His righteousness endures forever. And He has made His wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He has given food to those who fear Him. He, He will ever be mindful of His covenant He has declared to his people the power of his works and giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are verity and justice. All his precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. He has sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. Amen. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, a good and good understanding. Have all those who do His commandments, His praise endures forever. Let's pray. Father, thank You for that Word. And God, we ask You to speak to us through that Word this morning, that we might be the people that You desire us to be. Lord, help us to give You praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do my very best. I want to make a promise to you this morning. I I want to do my very best to let you out at a decent hour this morning. Amen? I, now, I'm serious. I want, to, I want to do my very best. Now, I don't mean I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do my best to let you out at a decent hour. But I want you to listen to this particular context of this passage of Scripture, or at least see that the psalmist is writing a command of praise to the people of God. See, I believe that praise and the people of God ought to go hand in hand. Amen? I believe we ought to be a praiseworthy people, that we ought to be a people that exalt the Lord in praise. And so in this passage, the psalmist calls the assembly to be reminded that God has called them to a posture of praise. He has blessed them by the works of His hands, and their gratitude should be reflected in their attitude. And that's a good one-liner right there. So let me go ahead and change that from their attitude should be reflected in their gratitude to your attitude should be reflective in your gratitude. Amen? You and I, because of what Jesus has done for us, our attitude ought to be an attitude of praise. Because God has been so good to us. And their their attitude should be one of praise and adoration to the one who is the object of their praise. And that is the one true living God. I love that song we sang just a few minutes ago. Our God is greater. And the reason why our God is greater is because there is no other gods. And so he is the greatest. And so the psalmist is just commanding the people of God... To praise the Lamb of God. To praise 
this God that we serve. Now listen to this statement. This is a good statement. God's command to praise is our invitation to praise. When God says praise the Lord in His Word, that's an invitation for you and I to praise His name, right? That's an invitation for you and I to be reflective on how God has blessed us and what He's done for us and that we exalt His holy and righteous name. That invitation should certainly be accepted humbly by the body of Jesus Christ. Would you agree with that? When God says to His people, praise the Lord, you and I ought to be willing to praise the Lord. Now let me ask you a personal question. What is it that would hold you back from praising God? Think about that. Each one of us may be different. But you and I, as children of God, who've been blessed by God, who've been saved by God, we ought to be willing to praise God. Now, teenagers, listen to me carefully. Because if you've been saved by the grace and the mercy of God, you ought to be willing to praise God. Right? Now, I understand we all do that different. But we ought to be willing to praise the Lamb of God. There are several words in the Hebrew language in the Old Testament that Uh, gives us the idea of praise. And I know you're excited about hearing a bunch of new words that you don't really understand, and I don't know how to pronounce. Amen? And so uh, I told my Sunday school class this morning because we had a lot of those names there in the book of Esther that are difficult to say, and I said, well, you don't know what they are either, so I'm just going to say them and we'll just act like they're right. And, and so there's a lot of Hebrew words. There's actually seven words that describe praise in the Hebrew language. And so I'm not going to give you the word. If you want it, you come up here and I'll, I'll let you read it off of here. But I want to give you the definitions of what they are. One of them means to hold out the hand or to worship with extended arms. That's what one of them means. All right. The other one for praise is to shine. It, it's like uh, a person's face is glowing. You ever heard somebody uh, say that that person's face was glowing? Maybe they've been in the presence of God and so their face seems to glow because they've got such, uh, such adoration about them at that particular moment. That's because they're praising God. So their face is like shining. It's like glowing. Now I'm not talking about their face turns some kind of color, but they just got this beam about them, right? You ever seen anybody like that? Okay, praise God. In the Baptist church, we've seen some folks. Amen. Yes, it's just this glow about them. And then there's two words that, uh, that mean to sing or to strike with the fingers uh, as in a musical instrument. And so it gives us the impression that we are praising God with the instrument. We are praising God with the song. And then there's two more words that mean rejoicing. It's a celebration of harvest, right? Now, we have a DNA around here of celebrating the victories, right? And so I wanted to thank you for doing what you did yesterday because... I, hey, I am praising God. I have a praise, a heart of celebration about what you did yesterday as a church body. And so that's what it's talking about, a celebration of harvest, a celebration of rejoicing. And then the last one means to kneel in a worshipful attitude. Kneel in a worshipful attitude. I was preaching the other day. Now, I, I, now listen, I, I just believe sometimes we ought to kneel before God. I believe we ought to have such a humble state before God. There are times whenever we need to kneel. Now, I realize some of you can't kneel. Amen? Okay, good. All y'all can kneel. I'll see you at the altar after the end of the service. We'll all kneel together. I realize some folks can't kneel. I had a lady come up to me one time after the service, and I was given an invitation like I always do, and she said, Brother Casey, I just want you to know, I don't come up there because I can't get down there and get up. And I said, I I understand that, amen. I'm going to get there one day. I'm almost there now. And and so I said, I I understand that. She said, and here's what she said. She said, but if if you will think about those of us who can't do that, and if you'll open up the front pews for us to just kind of sit down on, and that would be like us bowing in worship, and we'll just sit down there and we'll do it. I said, you know what? I, I said, I, thank you for reminding me that. I said, I'll, I'll do that tomorrow night. I did it the next night. She didn't come. I mean, listen to me. Look at me. She was in the building, but she didn't come. That's what I'm saying. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. She did come. She just didn't come down there when I opened up those. So listen, I I believe all of us ought to have a heart 
to bow down in worship, whether we can physically do that or not, we should certainly have the heart to praise God and bow down in worship of Him. When you look at each one of these words for praise, it gives you a sense of celebration and exaltation. Amen? Now, I'm one of those people, I can't help it. I'm happy clappy. I just can't help it. I get excited, and y'all start singing. Victoria's one of those people up, there, up here, too, if you haven't noticed. She's always got to be moving that hand and doing something and clapping. I feel the same way. I got to be bouncing. I got to be clapping. I got to be doing something. I just have this celebration inside of me about what God's done for me and who God is. You say, preacher, did you clap like that and you celebrate like that before you got saved? No, I did not. I did not celebrate about Jesus before I got saved, but I celebrate about him now, right? And so I'm just one of those clappy people. And it gives us the idea of celebrating and exalting. Listen to this statement. As the people of God, we are called to celebrate God. Hello? As a people of God, we are called to celebrate God. Our celebration of God is a... Listen to this. Our celebration of God is a testimony to a world without God. Lost people ought to be able to walk into this room and see you and I praising God. Now, let me, let me ask you a question. I'm, everybody good? Say amen. All right. What, what, do you, what do you think it looks like to the lost? Let's have, story, let's, have, let's have a conversation. What do you think it looks like to a lost world that comes into a church that's supposed to be, or comes into a gathering of people that are supposed to be a celebration Gathered to celebrate their great God. And they're going. I mean, some of us might be, we might as well do like this. Amen? What do you think that looks like to a lost and dying world? Hey, they don't want what we got because they can do that at the house. You and I ought to be a people of celebration. And so when the lost world comes into the church, and we ought to invite them to come into the church. Why? Because we love them, and God loves them. But when they get here, they ought to see a celebration, amen, not a funeral. Hello, somebody. And here's, listen to me. I want to make a statement. I want you to get this. Our praise matters. Our praise matters. It matters to a whole lot of people. You say, who does our praise matter to? Our praise matters to our sons and daughters who are lost. Let me ask you a question, sir, ma'am. You, you got a lost young person in your house, a, a son or a daughter or something like that. Now listen to me, that, that happens to all of us. Amen? They're not born saved. You know what I'm talking about? And so you've got one. Now, if, is your praise of God a testimony that would drive your son or daughter to Jesus? Now, now listen to me. Or is your, is your house, listen, is your house... Hey, I'm telling you now, we're not going to get out in time. If, 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 does your house, does your house have an atmosphere of praise that would drive your sons and daughters to Jesus? Or is your house so divided that it drives them away from Jesus? Now, now think about that because what we say and what we do at our homes and how we praise God at our homes, mat watch this, it matters more than what we do in this building. Because you know what we can do in this building? We can fake it in this building, but we can't fake it at our houses. Because they know about it, right? So our praise matters to our kids who are lost. Our praise matters to our brothers and our sisters who are lost. I mean, I, I've preached for a long time now, and I've seen tons of people lay out at altars, and they're crying and weeping for their sons and their daughters and their brothers and their sisters and their moms and their dads and their granddads and their granddaughters, and they're, just, they're weeping for the salvation of their souls. Listen, friends, your praise matters to people. It makes a difference. Your praise to God matters. It gives the lost world a picture of sacrifice and adoration for someone greater than ourselves. It gives us the opportunity to let the world know that God is worthy of exaltation. That he is worthy of our lives. Does my lifestyle give the impression of a lost and dying world that I love God enough to give myself to him? Does my praise reflect that? Does my life reflect that? See, you have to understand this morning, and I really hope you get this. I've repeated it multiple times. Your praise matters. It really does. It matters. 
in the long run. You say, preacher, why does my praise matter so much? Well, thank you for asking me. I'm going to tell you. Your praise is a testimony of your feelings toward God. Your praise matters because it is a testimony of your feelings toward God. Now, nobody has any trouble praising LSU when they make a touchdown. Right? Amen. You don't say amen to that one because you know you're guilty. Except for you Alabama fans. Our praise is a testimony of how we feel about our God. Now, I'm going to ask you a question, and this is an important question. So I want you to look at your neighbor and say, this is important. Don't go to sleep yet because he'll call you out. Okay, good question. <laughs> Those of you who are asleep, you went, oh, wait, hold up. If others characterize the credibility of your God by the dependability of your praise, would they believe that God is worthy enough to follow now, I'm going to say that again because that was very profound. Amen? Listen. If others characterize the credibility of your God by the dependability of your praise, would they believe God was worthy to follow? Now, we have no problem praising our kids. But we seem to have a problem praising God sometimes. But, but what I'm telling you, listen to me. We're not going to lead people to Jesus by the praise that we pour out on our kids. We will lead people to Jesus by the praise that we pour out on God. Amen? We'll lead our kids to Jesus by the way we pour out our praise to our God. That's what makes a difference. Now, I believe you ought to praise your kids. I, I, and I'm not against that. Amen? But I'm just saying there seems to be some sort of disconnect when it's time for us to praise God. We almost treat God as if He's a one hour a week kind of a deal. And we just come and we just do what we do. And then we leave and we really don't praise His name. But the Bible teaches us that we ought to praise God and your praise matters. If it was possible to win somebody to Christ through your praise to God, would you win anybody to Jesus? Now you think about that one. If it was possible to win somebody to Jesus through your praise, would you ever win anybody to Jesus? I hope. And I hope you realize that your praise matters to people. Say, preacher, I, I get it now. You're saying it matters. And I believe it matters. But how do I praise him? Well, he tells us in this text. Okay? Y'all with me still? Say amen. I feel, like I, feel like I lost you. I feel like I lost you. I want to stay an extra 30 minutes and get it back. I, I, feel, I feel like I lost you. Why does it matter how we pray? We, it, it matters how we praise. You say, what do you mean? Okay, how do we praise? Well, he says in the text, he says, with our whole heart. With our whole heart. You ever heard that statement, half-hearted praise? Anybody ever done it? Let me ask you a personal question. Now, don't, I'm not trying to, because I'm going to raise up both my hands. Amen. I'll raise up my foot too, all right? Listen to me. You ever come and half-hearted praise God? You ever done that? You, get, you, get, you just half-hearted, you just kind of come and you're half-hearted. Some of y'all there right now, amen? You're already thinking about something else. Listen. We should never praise God who saved us with a half heart. We ought to praise Him with our whole heart. Amen? And that's what He's telling us to do. That's what the psalmist says. Praise Him with your whole heart. We don't want half-hearted praise to define us. We want, the, we want to praise God with our whole heart so that our praise can speak a clear picture of how we feel about our God. Now, I'm going to give you some characteristics of praising God with a whole heart. This is some things that's necessary for you to praise God with a whole heart. Number one, listen carefully. You must know Him first. You've got to come to the place to where you, are, uh, you recognize that you're a sinner. You're separated from God. But God loves you enough to save you. And you repent of your sins and give your life to Jesus. And He saves you. And when you know God in that kind of manner, then you can begin to praise Him with your whole heart. And when you come to know Jesus like that, then you begin to know what Jesus has done for you. Jesus has rescued you out of the pit of hell. That's what Jesus has done. Praise God for that. Amen. He's rescued you from the pit of hell. And so you see that. And you worship with your whole heart because you see what He's done for you. And then once you come to that realization of what He's done for you, I'm telling you, you'll come to the realization of what He's done for other people. That He's saved other people like your kids and your friends and your neighbors and your relatives and even your enemies. You ever had somebody that, I, this is funny to me because some of Dee Dee's enemies that was in high school because of sports are now some of her best friends. 
It's amazing what Jesus will do, amen? He saves people and He reconciles people. And you come to that realization and so it enables you to praise Him with a whole heart. And when you realize that, you know that He is capable of still doing it for other people. And so you praise God. We come to the services and we bow before the Lord and we praise Him because we know He can still save our sons. He can still save our daughters. He can still save our mamas. He can still save our daddies. God still saves. If you're going to worship Him with your whole heart, you're going to have to be intimate with Him, which scares some of us to death, particularly men. We're scared to death to have an intimate moment with God. Because we're afraid that God's going to make us do something that we really don't want to do and it's going to make us uncomfortable. Hey, can I tell you something? God does that stuff all the time. You just got to get used to it. You do. But here's what I know about God. When He puts you in a situation to allow you to be obedient to Him, God will give you the strength to be able to be obedient to Him and bring glory to His name in the middle of that obedience. God will do that. So you just got to be intimate with Him. And then you have to minimize the distractions. Amen. Can I get a witness on that? Anybody ever get distracted sometimes in church and you get off and never, never land? And so therefore you can't be intimate with God and therefore your praise is just gone. You might, we might as well say amen. Now we're not going to do it right now, but we might as well say amen and let you go. Hello. Got to minimize the distractions. You say, how can I do that? Don't, don't, listen, don't focus on everything else. Focus on Jesus and what he's done for you, right? And you'll begin to have a praise moment in your mind and in your heart. Here, here's another one. This is the last one, uh, characteristic of praising God with your whole heart. Be obedient in the little things. Just be obedient in the little things. Being obedient in the little things leads to the presence of the great I am. Amen. <laughs> You just start simply being obedient to Jesus and Jesus does something amazing. He starts to move and he starts to work. And the next thing you know, you ever been in a situation like this? Some of you know what I'm talking about. You, you've, been, you've been so wanting to worship so bad, but you're sitting on your hands because you worry about what everybody else is thinking. You ever done that? And then you'll be sitting there. Let me give you an illustration because I like visuals. You know what I'm saying? So you're sitting there like this and you're going, I mean, and you, you're going, oh, and you're singing. And they're singing, a great I am. And you're just getting after it, getting after it. And then all of a sudden you're like, What happened at that moment? You got a little more freedom, didn't you? So your praise got a little better, didn't it? Because all of a sudden now you were minimizing the distraction to what everybody was thinking. Now you're still thinking about what they're thinking a little bit, right? But then after a little while you say, and then you're carrying the TV. Amen? Feeling good about it. Then you're going to go and say, I don't care if they're standing or not, I'm standing. And then you just... You just start worshiping and praising God in the middle of a crowd and nobody else is standing up but you. Now, little by little, God brought you to that point and it started with taking that first hand out. Then taking that second hand out. And then raising that hand up and then standing up. But it started in the little things, amen? If you and I want to be great uh, 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 praise warriors for Christ it starts in the little things being obedient in the simple things and God will use that and God will bless you know what I think about when I think about somebody that was a, a, a people that were very praiseworthy and they were doing it in the little things no matter what the circumstance I think about Paul and Silas whenever they in that prison you remember that story good night isn't that an awesome story good night that's a Greek word you remember that they're in prison. They've been beaten within an inch of their life. They got blood all over them. They've been flogged severely, the scripture says. And here they are at midnight. I mean, if you don't got your tail whooping blood hanging off of you and you all messed up because of that, I'm thinking at midnight you want to be sleeping. Hello? Some of y'all want to be sleeping at 12. Daytime. I'd be wanting to sleep, but here they are. They're sitting there singing praise to God in the middle of a prison. They're being obedient to praise God in the middle of a crazy circumstance. Here's why. They understood that their praise mattered. It mattered. Wholehearted praise exalts God, empowers us, and encourages other people. Remember the, what happened in the rest of that story? The, the, the doors flew open. I mean, hey, look, what's crazy? They started praising and God showed up, didn't he? He showed up and he, and he showed up and he shook things up. Broke the, cha the, 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 the chains come off and the doors flew open. Uh, all the lights were out. And it, I mean, the people, and the crazy thing about it is, people just stayed there. 
They could have left, but they didn't. They were mesmerized almost with the presence of God. And these jokers are sitting there praising the Lord in the middle of all of that stuff. It, it exalted God, it empowered them, and it encouraged the others that were around them. That, that, that Roman guard came falling down on his knees and said, What must, sir? I mean, you don't call prisoners sirs. Hello? Sirs, what, what, what must we do to be saved? I'll tell you what you can do. Come clean us up, and we're going to tell you all about it. And they did. The Bible says their whole household got saved. Listen to this. Why do we praise God? Now, the passage tells you, and I'm not going to walk through all of the Scripture, but I'm going to give you what they are. One, we praise God because He's the eternal Creator. Uh, verse 2 through 4 teaches us that. We praise God, uh, verse 4 and 6, because He is a compassionate provider. Have you ever had God provide for you, and you were thanking God for that? I always say this around my house, that God shows up in the mailbox. Because when I was in evangelism, that's where God showed up a lot of times. He provided for us through the mailbox. Just a check from somebody you don't even know that you preached at their church and you have no idea who they are. Just want to bless you, leave a note, and give you, a, give you one of them long wheelbase ten. He's a provider. He's a compassionate provider. Ver, uh, chapter, I mean, verse 7 and 8, He is just and fair. And so we praise His holy name because He's fair and He's just. Amen. Aren't we as parents and people so impartial? Sometimes we can't hear the truth because we don't want to hear the truth. But God is always fair and He's always just. Amen? And we can praise His name for that. And then I love this one. Verse 9 teaches us that He is redemptive. And so we praise Him for that. Look what it says. He has sent redemption to His people. Now that's where Jesus fits in the narrative. That's where Jesus comes into play. He is redemptive. He sent a Savior for you and I. When you and I didn't deserve a Savior, God sent a Savior. You say, why did He do that, preacher? Because He loved us. Because He loved us. And He wanted us to have fellowship with Him. And because, hey listen, because He desired to be with us, not that we could add anything to God's life, but that God could add everything to our lives. And so God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die and to pay a debt that you and I could not pay. And it's amazing to me how so cavalier we are with that truth. He died for us, man. I, I ain't doing it for you. I love you. Amen? I hate to say it. I'm not, I'll go to another church before I die with, for you. Now listen. <laughs> Before you get super spiritual, let somebody walk in here in a gun, with a gun, point it to your head, and say, die for the preacher, and see what you do. Preach, I like you and all that, but uh, there'll be another one come after you. <laughs> I, I, I love you and everything, but somebody else coming after you, brother. Adios. But God loved us enough to send uh, one of his 87 sons. no. One son, only son, only son, he sent him to die on a cruel cross of Calvary so that you and I could have everlasting life. What a God. What a God. I'm sure all of you would be willing to do that. No, but God did. And so we praise him because he is redemptive. We praise him because he sent his son, Jesus, to die for us. Man rebelled against him. But God provided a gift of grace. And that was His Son, Jesus. And God offers salvation to us. He offers us the opportunity to be saved. I mean, that's just glorious in itself that God would offer that. And then when we give our life to Jesus, He pledges Himself to us for all eternity. I will always protect you. I will always love you. I will always be your advocate. I will always answer for you. The Bible says he's seated at the right hand of God, interceding for those who believe. He stands in the gap for me. And I love this part, and this is the last thing, and I want you to listen. The Scripture says in verse 10, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do His commandments. Listen to this. His praise endures forever. Forever. Listen to this statement. There will always be a God to praise. And there will always be praise given to this God by someone. He's always going to be there. There's always going to be praise that's going to be given to Him. The question for you and I is simply this. Are you and I 
going to be the ones giving him that praise. That's the question this morning. He said, Preacher, I'm, not, I'm just not real sure about that. Well, here's what's so glorious about it. You can be sure about it today. You can be sure in this truth that the Scripture teaches that you and I can turn from our sin, turn from our wickedness, and let's don't act like, let's not try to act like we don't all have wickedness in our life because we know as human beings we've sinned against God, okay? I mean, there's, we cuss, we lied, we've stolen, we've done all kinds of stuff. And in the middle of all that, God says, you know what, I still love y'all sorry selves that I'm going to offer you salvation. In the middle of all your sin, I'm going to offer you salvation and offer to redeem you. And so we offered His Son. And He says to us today, He says, if you want forgiveness of your sins and you want to be made right with God, you come to the Son. You come to the Son. You trust the Son by faith. You trust in Him as one and only Savior of the world. Yield yourself to His authority. Trust Him. And He'll save you. And when He does, I guarantee you'll be a praise-given person. Because he sets you free from the depths of hell. Now here's the reality. Not everybody in this room can say that. Not everybody in this room can say that you've done that. But you can before you leave. But it's just up to you, what you whether you want to do that or not. So friend, I'm going to encourage you to be a praiseworthy person. But that's not going to happen until you give your life to Jesus. So give your life to Jesus today. Not so you can praise him. But because he loves you. And he wants you. Amen. He don't need you. But he wants you. Give your life to Him today.